When African Americans were denied equal service at a Wichita lunch counter, Ron Walters led a student sit-in protest in 1958 as the NAACP Youth Council president, even though this effort was not supported by the national organization. As a result, Walters was inspired to promote leadership in the African American community, becoming a catalyst for justice around the world. The Wichita, Kansas of the early 20th century was one of the most segregated communities in the state. Located near the Oklahoma border, Wichita tended to reflect Southern views, although racism was more subtle than in the Deep South, without signs to deny service. But it would be made plain and clear once you sat down and someone might walk by you two or three times before they finally would get the idea that you were there for, other than holding that seat down and would just politely tell you uh, that we don't serve colored here. Despite an 1874 state law prohibiting unequal service in public places, all of the downtown restaurants discriminated against African Americans. Several unorganized attempts were made to change the discriminatory policies at different stores in the city, but these efforts had little effect. Dockham Drugstore was one of the most prominent chains in Wichita. A part of the Rexall franchise, Dockham operated nine stores in the city, and the downtown location was the place to go for hungry workers and shoppers. Here, white patrons always took precedence over black customers, who were forced to order from a window at the end of the counter and take their food outside. Ron Walters and his cousin Carol Parks grew up in Wichita. Carol's mother, Vivian, was president of the local NAACP. The Parks home frequently hosted national black leaders, including Rosa Parks and Franklin Williams, who shared their experiences with Ron and Carol. As college students in 1958, they became president and vice president of the Youth Council, and Chester Lewis became the chapter president and their mentor. Ron proposed that the group conduct a sustained sit-in at Dockham Drugstore to bring about change. To ensure that this effort would be successful, Ron carefully organized and planned the protest. He wanted to follow tactics of the Montgomery bus boycott, sitting quietly and not reacting to taunts. To do this, he trained the students for several weeks at a local church to prepare for the difficult situations that might occur. We used the basement of that church uh, to, uh, to simulate of what it would be like to sit on the stools, uh, what we would encounter. Would people you know, try to uh, pour coffee down our back, or cigarettes, burns, or taunts? Uh, just what would happen. And uh, we were able to, uh, to, to design this so that we then were the perpetrators and other people who sat on the stools had to react. Uh, the point was not to react. Uh, the point was to sit uh, with dignity uh, and uh, with purpose uh, and to not be dissuaded. Ron spoke at local churches, high schools, and organizations to recruit volunteers to participate. Through his efforts, he was able to encourage as many as 40 members to take part in the sit-in. When Vivian Parks and Chester Lewis explained to the national office what the students would be doing, the NAACP strongly advised them to discontinue their efforts because the organization worked through legal means and not protests. Ron was not discouraged, and he proceeded with the plan. Starting on Saturday, July 19th, students filled the lunch counter stools from just before lunch to closing time, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. They were occasionally supported by picketers outside. Each week that we went, I, I think there was a heightened sense of consciousness and uh, uh, anxiety about what, what might happen. Um, but we tried to go about it in a very diplomatic and uh, uh, serious way. During the sit-in, there was relatively little coverage in the media. Because Dockums was a major advertiser, Neither of Wichita's two daily newspapers wished to offend them, although one did run a small article towards the end of the sit-in. Wichita's black weekly newspapers ran a few stories that were carried by the Associated Press, and one Wichita radio station did an interview with the participants. Although the protest was non-violent, the group was threatened twice. One day uh, we had uh, some motorcycle-looking toughs uh, come in the drugstore, and. Um, I said that, well, they were going to disrupt the place. Um, I got off the stool and called the, the city police and asked if uh, they wouldn't come. The officer that arrived told them he was to keep his hands off. 
Instead, Ron called Turner's Drugstore, the group's base, for assistance. Three carloads of black students arrived in support, and the white youths immediately departed. On August 11, 1958, as the students took their places, the manager walked in and announced, serve them. This victory would propel Ron into a career of civil rights involvement. The success at Dockham spread to drugstores across the country. All nine stores in Wichita were desegregated, and because Dockham was a part of the statewide Rexall chain, all Rexall stores in Kansas changed their policies. The weekend after the policy change at Dockham, Walters described their effort at an NAACP convention in Oklahoma City. A few days later, the Oklahoma City Youth Council began a two-week sit-in at Katz Drugstore. Because of their success, the Oklahoma City participants shared their story at the 1959 NAACP National Convention, where North Carolina University student Ezel Blair was in attendance. Two years after the Oklahoma sit-in, Blair and three other college students took their seats at a Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina to protest racial discrimination, spurring the sit-in phase of the civil rights movement. Walter's efforts with the Dockham sit-in ultimately changed his life. While attending the Race Relations Institute at Fisk University, he received an internship to work at the U.S. State Department, where he met with President Kennedy. Inspired by Kennedy's policy toward African nations, Walters became captivated with international relations, which he went on to teach as a professor at major universities. While also advising two congressmen, Walters was invited to participate in the 1983 Black Leadership Roundtable, where members were discussing the upcoming presidential campaign. It was here that Walters met Reverend Jesse Jackson. After the meeting, he asked me to accompany him back to Washington, D.C. That led him to ask me to direct the issues for his campaign in 1984. This platform created the Rainbow Coalition, which brought together minorities, working class, and progressives to address equal rights, jobs programs, voting rights, and apartheid. Walters contributed to a team that brought out as many as three million voters in Jackson's first campaign. Jackson's loss in 1984 led to an even stronger campaign in 1988, and though his ideas proved too liberal for the Democratic Party at the time, he came in second to the party's nominee. One of the most notable effects of the Jackson campaign was his stand on apartheid. With his experience on the presidential campaigns and work with Congressman William Gray, Walters authored what came to be the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act, which passed in 1986. This act established sanctions against South Africa and demanded the release of nonviolent activist and political prisoner Nelson Mandela and set a timeline to end the legal segregation in the country. At that time, tensions in South Africa were increasing. Many countries were starting to pressure the South African government by pushing for negotiations and providing financial support to the anti-apartheid effort. The government eventually succumbed to demands, and in 1993, apartheid was finally dismantled. The next year heralded the country's first multiracial democratic election. Walters and Jackson were members of President Clinton's envoy to ensure that the election was free and fair. And in May of that year, Mandela was inaugurated as South Africa's first black president. Currently, Walters serves as a professor of government and politics at the University of Maryland. As a media analyst on African-American issues, he has become a respected voice during presidential campaigns, featured regularly with major news network organizations. Throughout his career, he has encouraged African Americans to take leadership roles in politics, authoring numerous books and articles, and conducting lectures at major institutions. His vision was finally realized in the 2008 presidential election of Barack Obama. Because of Ron Walter's leadership in the Wichita NAACP Youth Council, he has gone on to become an important voice in civil rights. Walter's organization of the Dockham effort led him to be called the father of the modern sit-in and propelled him into a career of politics and international relations, where he has become a guiding force for change. From participating in the creation of anti-apartheid law to helping ensure the fair election of Nelson Mandela, Walter's work has impacted the world. His involvement in American politics helped encourage African-American interest in presidential campaigns, helping to open their eyes to the possibilities, and eventually changed the course of history.